All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seed Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. So this is a really timely event uh, for us to be doing today. This week is all about climate change here at Exploring by the Seed Your Pants. We've been taking a deep dive uh, into the issue, talking to scientists, to explorers, to uh, filmmakers, um, and photographers around the world who are researching, who are documenting, and of course, looking for solutions to our global uh, climate crisis. So all week long, we've been hosting events. We've probably had about 22 uh, live events, and there's still a few more days to go. We still have a few more days of climate events. So if you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find those events, join with your classrooms. Uh, we'd love to see you there. So one of our favorites, well, I mean, we've been doing two to three visits a month, which has been pretty awesome. Uh, but we love connecting with Sunava Sorby and Hilda uh, Strom from Hearts in the Ice. Uh, live from Bumsabu uh, in Svalbard. So in 2019, uh, 2020, they became the first women to overwinter in Svalbard solo. They spent 12 months at that remote trapper's cabin called Bumsabu. It's located at 78 degrees north and 140 kilometers from the closest town of Long Yerbian. Um, climate change isn't taking a break, so neither are they. They returned to Svalbard in November. They've been overwintering at the cabin uh, and will do so until May 2021. This time though, they brought along a team of 10 global partners. So Hearts in the Ice can act as the bridge between science and global citizens to better understand climate change and why we all need to play a role. They will continue to serve as citizen scientists on a variety of projects, and there are some amazing projects, observing clouds and the auroras, flying drones to monitor ice, collecting phytoplankton samples and ice cores, uh, and they're building on a second year of data collection. So cool. So we have, through the magic of technology, Hilda and Sunova joining us live via satellite phone. How are we doing today? Hey, Bo, we're doing good, thank you. How are you doing over there in Canada? Uh, spring has sprung. It has warmed up a little bit, so pretty good. Pretty good. That's good. We are just having another um, storm outside the door. Uh, we were expecting calm weather and uh, took our kayaks uh, to do some uh, citizen science work today. And um, all of a sudden it's a snowstorm again. So this winter has been very much unpredictable, so much milder than last year, less sea ice. And um, yeah, so I think you have some pictures there even with Estra out on the uh, ice that's uh, ice flows. So we last year we had ice from maybe October, November, and the solid ice from December. And this year the ice formed in in March, which is a pity for uh, both the seals, the polar bears, and we've also had a, a lot of rain. So um, so the, the the tundra is full of ice. So it's it's the wildlife is struggling. But today we were supposed to pick up some um, phytoplankton with our kayaks. Um, yeah, no, so we're, we're busy. All right. Well, I love the pictures of, uh, the two of you out on the ice with Etra. Um, you know, it's a very kind of white and gray landscape, but it's still very, very beautiful. You're in an amazing place. We are. We're actually right now, if we look out the window, um, it's like 360 degrees of white here, Joe. And that, uh, that grayness, it's sort of prevalent right now. What's so, um, that picture of us with Etta on the background, uh, in the background with the ice, that's uh, ice starting to form and it binds together. And just as quickly as it formed, it seems to have disappeared. So it's really, like you just said, uh, change is the only constant here. Yeah, wow, absolutely. Um, so looking through the images that you shared with me, I see a beautiful panorama kind of, I've got the lone figure walking uh, in a very wintry landscape. That's um, that's thing that we go up to, uh, we have lots of areas to walk here where ideally we have vantage points where we can see the polar bears uh, down below. We always carry binoculars with us and we always walk with a safety belt that's got a flare gun, a revolver, a swift tool, um, so we're, we dressed, we, we dressed for the occasion every time and that picture was taken just two days ago, actually. Oh, wow. You know, you mentioned, uh, we talked about in the introduction, 140 
kilometers from your nearest neighbors. Your your neighbors are the polar bears. And there's a story that I love uh, if if you can share with us today um, of when you had a, a visitor before Etra came back and just how close that visitor got. Yeah, yeah, we've had uh, a few of them actually uh, this winter. We had the polar bear all the way up to our door. We heard we heard something outside, and we dressed up. Uh, Etra wasn't here just uh, just then. We dressed up and walked outside. And the minute I was opening the door, the polar bear were were literally at our door. So I couldn't open the door. I, I felt something was there, but uh, it's it's. Um, he got scared and, and run off maybe 20 meters and uh, and played in yeah down at the beach. So we, we really got to see him. That was in the, in the dark season, so we had a, a big torch. But we also had a, a similar uh, incident with a polar bear mom with two last year's uh, cubs. Uh, they are almost as big as their mom now. And they, uh, Etra was in, in the entrance. And um, the door was a little bit open, but we, it's still secured. But it's a little bit open for her to be cold and nice in the entrance. She has a lot of fur, and she starts barking. And we know instantly when she barks, it's a polar bear. She never barks. So <laughs> it was actually three of them. And that was uh, uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. It was now in March, but it was completely dark. And we, we got, to, got to see them just wander off uh, quietly, peacefully. Uh, in the big torch that we have here. So that was also a very, very close encounter with polar bears. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. So I see a picture here and it looks like you might have some company. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's our first, uh, our first visitors here. Actually, um, where that picture is taken is out on the fjord, and they were the first group to take the snowmobile ride from Longyearbyen to Bumsabu. It took them, what, five hours, Hilda? took them, yeah, about five hours, and they are a group of researchers from the University Center in Stalbad, and we're collecting ice core samples from them, uh, for them, excuse me, um, and they came to actually drop off some more equipment for us to measure uh, light under the sea ice. So they had some contraption. They, they drilled the hole, um, and then they plunged that into the hole, and it stays there. It's going to stay until we leave Bumsabu in May. So, um, they're really interested in what's, what's blooming under the sea ice, the, um, sea ice algae. So that was, a uh, Kind of neat because they also brought some fresh um, apples and fresh oranges and some more, um, you know, dairy things that we needed. So it's always nice to have a visitor because we know we're going to get a tiny little resupply of some fresh food because we were all out. Yeah, yeah. And that definitely does not happen uh, often. And I'm, wow, five hours on a, on a snowmobile. That's intense. Yeah, it's intense, and it's um, they carry a big sled behind them, um, so they have to have the right visibility. and And they came actually last Wednesday, which happened to be my birthday, and um, they came and left the same day. And then we had that big hurricane storm on Thursday, so the opportunities to get here are really, really uh, marginal. And there's no way for a ship to get in here right now, and there it's just barely possible for a snowmobile. Uh, to get here. So to have a visitor was quite a highlight, as you can imagine. Yeah. Well, first of all, happy belated birthday. And second, how do you celebrate your birthday at Bumsabu? Well, if you're lucky, you have somebody called Hilda, who um, was in the baking mood, and she baked uh, some cinnamon rolls and served me coffee in my bed and uh, brought out a huge Norwegian flag and sang a Norwegian birthday song, which asked me to repeat because I always forget the words. It's not like happy birthday to you. Um, and then uh, we had a really nice dinner that night. It was just so special to be in a place like this uh, where my only wish, uh, he just reminded me, I had a wish actually, and it was just to see a polar bear. And, and I'm not kidding about this, Joe. I took the binoculars, and everybody from the University Center of Svalbard was inside Bumsabu at the time having coffee and tea with us. 
And I look out the window with the binoculars and I see the large male polar bear just meandering out on the ice. And I got my wish for my birthday and that was the polar bear. So, you know, be careful what you ask for, I guess. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, absolutely amazing. That's a pretty, uh, a pretty sweet birthday wish. Uh, the last image. Yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. The last image I want to highlight is, you know, I just love these images of, of Bum Sabu and, and, uh, you know, the Northern lights over top the auroras. It, uh, I mean, is there, is there a greater show on earth than that? Uh, no. And that's something that never changed. Um, and, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, it, it's absolutely beautiful. That night, it was also uh, a moon, moonshine. I'm not sure if you can see that. Uh, but uh, you see the green and you see the blue sky. And um, yeah, that was, yeah, actually it was last night. <laughs> so, so um, no, it, it's really magical. And sometimes, uh, I mean, we had a big storm out in the outer space. Um, it was the 4th or 3rd of March. And we had the most beautiful colors you can ever imagine. And we don't have any artificial light to disturb our views or scenery. So it was uh, absolutely uh, beautiful. But I mean, every time it's clear weather and there are some activity from the sun, uh, the northern light is, uh, and we're out the door. We're outside taking pictures. All right. Excellent. Well, it's so great to catch up and we're definitely going to open things up for some questions um from our classroom groups in a little bit but i think it's time we bring in our guest for today i'm really excited to introduce her yeah and um just want to thank uh, very much inga uh, for joining us today it's an honor she's someone that we've recently had the pleasure of meeting and so it's so fitting that she represents the last phone call in the, in our theme this month with it which is the power of community and we're also really super grateful for Hyundai for supporting the education platform so that we can do all of this with you, Joe, and, and all the schools on the call. So thank you so much, Inga, and, and thanks so much to you, Joe. All right. Absolutely. It has been all incredible. Right. I think we're close to 100,000 students who have joined us this year. So uh, it's just a ton of fun to be able to do these events. All right. I'm really excited to now uh, introduce uh, Inga Ruff, who will be joining us. And she's going to share a little bit of the importance of community and collaboration as we tackle the loss of polar ice. So she's the executive director and co-founder of Global Choices. This is a female-led organization working uh, with their youth-led intergenerational community of Arctic angels to highlight how critical it is to protect polar ice. Her journey's taken her from senior roles in business to working for presidents and prime ministers and royalty to working with some of the poorest war-torn countries like Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Egypt where survival depends on community. So I'm going to bring her in with us now. Hi, Inga, how are you doing? Hi, hi, Joe, and um, so lovely to be here. Yeah, well, it's, it's and great. And hi, Hilda and Silva. I always get yeah. a real buzz from actually connecting with you by satellite because, you know, it's so remote, and yet you feel as if you're right in the living room. Absolutely. So cool. So good. The power of technology um, to be able to connect from somewhere so remote and, and have these live events is, is just incredible. So Inga, I'm going to share my screen now because I know uh, we've got a little presentation. So I'm going to make sure that's queued up and ready. And uh, yeah, when you're ready, just let me know. Absolutely. I'm, I'm ready to roll. Let me just move my screen up too so we can be in sync. So, um, yeah, th well, thank you all, and, and thank you to all of you who are listening. Um, you've been hearing about uh, heroic journeys like those of Hilda and Suniva out there in the dark and the frozen Arctic. And um, I was listening into Nacho's incredible walk walking journey. And I have to say, my journey has been very different. It's not heroic, and it's far less planned or intentional. And not in my wildest dreams would I have imagined I would have had the experiences I've had. I guess my journey is more like the quote, you know, life is what happens when you're making other plans. And the only intention that I think has been a constant has been the desire for social justice and to do a bit of good in the world. Um, oh, and I do recall when I was young just saying to my mom that I actually wanted to work at the UN. 
And I guess that's what I want to share with you today, that even ordinary folk like me can have an impact if you're willing to experience uniqueness and to seize opportunities and to travel by the seat of your pants. So let me start at the beginning. Um, I'm an African. I was born in South Africa, a beautiful country where we experienced big open skies and saw a lot of these. And Joe, um, we have a slide of the animals there. There was no internet, no computer games, or even TV until I was in my late teens. And we spent most of our time outdoors, which gave me a lifelong appreciation for nature. And then if we move to the Mandela slide, it was also an unequal society because it was based on skin color. My parents were immigrants. We didn't have a lot of money, but my liberal English father and my Danish mother taught us about equality and inclusion and social justice from a very early age. And that started my activism and the quest for social justice that actually led to us leaving South Africa for London um, in protest against apartheid. Nelson Mandela was still in prison at the time, and I had no idea that in years to come, I would be working for him and for the elders in London. If you have a look at the next slide, which is a class in action where in Egypt, where I was involved in a volunteer project. This was in the Sinai Desert, and where I really understood how vital community is, especially for rural women, many of whom had no access to education or their own livelihoods. And what women wanted more than anything was to be able to read and to write and for their children to do the same. We have a look at this slide. You'll see Salima, who's doing the teaching, is a local woman. She was the only one who had a driver's license. And she would come every week and hold classes in the front of someone's house, in the front room. And it made me aware of what an enormous privilege it is to have an education. And despite the fact they were very poor, we were often invited to homes to share meals, and it was very moving to be welcomed with warmth and hospitality because that's how their communities work. And on the next slide, you'll see that we got involved in building a desert school. The Bedouin desert communities are nomadic, and they didn't want fixed schools in town. So here we are, a collective, helping them, and we can run through a couple of these slides, helping them to build a school out of local stone. And it was very much a communal effort. Even the children joined in. And because they have centuries of living in this harsh environment, they use their indigenous knowledge to choose the placement of the school and just see how sympathetic it is to the landscape. And Joe, if you run through these, we'll get down to, you can see where we were all hauling buckets with stones. Um, and then you'll see, we found one day coming up to the building, a rainbow appeared. And that afternoon, it rained for the first time in five years. And some of these little kids were really scared, as they had never seen rain. And it was actually, we all danced in the, in the desert. And I suppose, Cinema and Hilda, you've probably done that in the snow a few times, right? And then another adventure I had was in Ladakh. This was an unexpected opportunity to be involved in building an eco-school for Tibetan refugee children in the high Himalayas in North India. It's a lot more sophisticated a building, as you can see um, when we scroll through these. Um, it was again built out of local materials, and it blends with its awesome surroundings of these majestic snow-capped mountains. And it has a really minimal environmental footprint. It's won all sorts of awards. And I wonder, actually, if your schools have solar panels and if your school measures their eco footprint. Mine didn't when I was at school. And then if you have a look um, at these faces of these young children, many of them here at school came as refugees. And when you're an immigrant or a refugee, having a community around you is the way you survive and adapt. And from my journeys, I have learned just as Natsha did on his walk, the people everywhere all want to belong. They all want to have a place to call home and want to have an opportunity to learn and to thrive, no matter what your nationality, gender, skin color, religion, or how much or how little money you have. And talking of gender and inclusion, if you have a look at the next slide, um, here is a picture of, of a school in Somalia 
And can you notice anything different between this and the previous picture of the school children in the dust? No girls. In many places I visited, like Libya, Syria, Iraq, often girls were still excluded from school in favor of boys. And if you have a look at the next picture, there is, this is of a wonderful woman called Asha Haji Elmi, whom I had the privilege to work with. And Asha built a network across Somalia called Save Somali Children, Women and Children, and she was fighting for the inclusion of women. And when the Somali peace talks were on, Asha asked why were there no women represented, only to be told you had to be a leader of a clan to participate, and all the leaders were men. So what did she do? She started a women's clan, and she became one of the very few women to be a signatory to a peace talk. Um, and here she is on this picture being recognized by global leaders of the international community for her work. And what is also interesting, I think, that you'll find is that experts like the Booking Institute have agreed that educating girls is a very valuable tool against climate change. And female leaders especially are more likely to pursue more sustainable futures for their communities. So here we are, one of a, a real favorite quote of mine. Just as we are understanding ourselves better as, as an interrelated human family, we are also seeing that we are, all, we are inextricably linked to Mother Earth. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, all life is interrelated, and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And if we move to the next slide, um, one of the most powerful experiences I had of this oneness with nature was when I visited Zambia. And I had the opportunity to swim at the top of the Victoria Falls. This is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. It's one of the Earth's largest waterfalls. And it was early one morning. No one was around. Just the roar of the water, the rainbows, and my tears of awe, adding to the million gallons falling 350 feet into the gorge below. Seven-tenths of my body and our bodies is made of water. And in that moment, I felt absolutely no separation with nature. So that's been a bit of a global romp. And now we come to the ice and, and, and a different journey. And if we have a look at this slide of the ice loss, it was the realization of the interconnectedness of all Earth systems and learning that we have already lost 28 trillion tons of ice in the last few years. And this is what prompted Sally Rani and I to co-found global choices. What does 28 trillion tons look like? Well, that's enough to cover the surface of the entire UK with a sheet of frozen water 300 feet thick. And once you can't find ice, once it's gone, it's gone. And take a look at this ecosystem slide and the impact of losing the polar ice. The caps on the earth, they are, they are caps on the ends of the earth and they deflect the sun's heat and are so critical. They're like refrigeration systems. And what the impact of losing them will be felt not only in the Arctic ecosystem, which as you can see from this picture is a very biodiverse and interconnected one, but even bigger than that, it'll affect the oceans, the atmosphere, biodiversity, our weather. I think you remember the, um, the polar vortex that hit Texas recently. That was attributed to, to Arctic um, changes and sea level rise. And that has consequences for millions of people in terms of drought, in terms of floods. If we have a look at the next slide, you'll see um, food insecurity and migration impacting as ever the poorest communities, particularly like those that I have visited. So our mission is to urgently raise the ice crisis to the top of the political agenda and to spur faster action on reducing emissions and global warming. We all have a responsibility here to watch our carbon footprint because every one ton of carbon saves an equal, equal of three meters square of ice. And we also need to protect that existing Arctic ice from harm, from shipping lanes and from deep seabed mining and from seismic testing. And really the only way to do this is with intergenerational effort. And so we have been building a community called Arctic Angels. And if we have a look at the next slide, 
Um, these are amazing young activists, and we already have 26 of them present in 17 countries, and they range from age 9 to 33. And if we, what do they do? We believe in investing and training young leaders to be the climate advocates for a sustainable future. And do have a look at our social media and our website um, to see what they, they have been up to. And it has to be a, an intergenerational effort because it's not going to happen just with one generation blaming another. It's so acute what we're facing that we need to put all our efforts together to make it happen. And we hear so much about climate disasters and pessimism. But, you know, working with so many amazing young people has made me optimistic. If you have a look at the next slide, which is this young mum and her son teaching him about plants and teaching him about nature. Um, I think there is everything to fight for. Yes, it will be challenging. It will be a massively difficult transition. But you know, if I'm if I'm really honest, I am somewhat envious of next generation because of what you will have in your lifetime will be the wholesale change of systems with the technology to create global communities and opportunities for purposeful jobs. It will be a more sustainable world. And it's one that we oldies have worked so hard for and could only dream of. So let's share our, our knowledge and the value of indigenous wisdom and pass them on from generation to generation. And the next slide is, is taken at the UN. So yes, it took me 30 years, but I did make it to the UN. And what are the deepest learnings from my journey? Well, what I can share with you is that uh, I want to find things that encourage you to embark on your own adventures. So I would say celebrate your uniqueness and recognize diversity is how nature thrives. And we need to look around and ask if we really are open to people whom we regard as different from us. Maybe they are actually more similar than we imagine. And kindness. I mean, kindness is the glue of community. Take care of your community and your community will care for you. And aim to be wise rather than smart. And that wisdom shows up in any age. I've seen a lot of very wise young people and a lot of very dumb adults. <laughs> and look at nature, really look at nature and see how awesome it is. And what that requires is that we learn to pay attention. And this is so hard in a world full of distraction. So for a bit, turn off social media, find big open spaces, and just appreciate silence, and which I know is something that Hilda and Suniva have been doing so much of. Silence is a wonderful teacher. And I, I want to share with you a quote from a book called The Little Prince, because it sums it up for me. You know, the best things aren't things and can only be seen with the eye of the heart. And Joe, I think you're going to play a little clip <laughs> of um, a fabulous uh, street art artist called David Zinn. Um, I'm just so inspired by the unique way he sees things and how he creatively celebrates the world. And I hope he will inspire you too, to really just look at things differently. Take the time and be creative in creating your own adventures. So I want to say over to you guys and get that play and say thank you. Right. I'm going to come back in now. Uh, Inga, that was so great. What an awesome presentation. Thank you so much uh, for sharing those perspectives with us, taking us on a little bit of your journey, your global journey, and sharing what you've learned uh, through these journeys. All right. Excellent. Well, I say it's time that we open things up uh, to a little Q&A action. Uh, so those who are tuning in live, feel free to use the chat sidebar 
uh, questions for Inga, questions for Hilda and Sunova. Uh, it is all fair game right now. And I am going to start by bringing in one of our camera groups. So we've got Mr. Shattuck's crew. They're hanging out with us in Chalk River, Ontario. So here in Canada. Let me bring it in. How are we doing? Hi. Hi. What's your favorite Hi. place that you visited? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry, I didn't hear that. What's your favorite place that you've been to? Wow, that's a difficult wow, one. That's a difficult one. Um, I think I would have to say the African bush, where you're in nature and you see animals in the wild, and you just see how symbiotically the animals live with nature and you realize that and it, it, somehow with those very big open skies, it, it sort of right sizes you and you realize that we are just a little itty bitty piece of nature. Um, and, and nature works in this amazing cycle and it's just, yeah, it's that sort of all. So that, that I would say is probably one of my, if not the favorite place to be. All right, awesome. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna bring in Miss Huxley. Miss Huxley is joining us. She has her crew, um, there we go, uh, joining us in Ontario, grade four or five. How are we doing, Miss Huxley? I'm doing well, thanks for having us today, Joel. Of course. And Inga, we have a question from a grade five student who would like to know how young people can help to save the polar ice. We are in the city of Brampton, so we're a little bit far away from nature as we know it in, at large, but. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a very interesting thing. And I think part of the reason why uh, the Arctic has been, and, and the poles generally have a bit, been a bit neglected is because people think there are snowy wastes up there somewhere and they don't actually affect us. So, what we are trying to do and we're busy building is a campaign around making it relative to us. And as I said, you know, one ton of ice is saving a ton of, of one ton of ice, saving one ton of carbon, you know, is equivalent to saving three meters square of ice. And so we're trying to find ways to make that a really a visual thing and a visceral thing. But of course, the very practical things you need to do is to try and reduce your carbon footprint and to think about ways in which we can reduce global warming. Now, there are so many ways in which you could do that from you know, making sure that your schools and your homes are um, energy efficient, um, how we consume things, and you know, just in our local environment, also reminding others that you know, this carbon is the thing and this global warming is the thing that is actually harming the habitats of so many and will affect people everywhere. It's not just in the Arctic. So what we will be doing in a couple of months, we'll be launching a campaign. So do, you know, feel free to go onto our website and um, sign up for your interest and we will start engaging um, once we've, we've actually developed that campaign to a point where we can bring movements of people together to push politicians to protect what's left of the ice because the central Arctic Ocean ice is being threatened by the desire to put a shipping lane right to the middle of it. And, you know, we can be, as a collective, be lobbying politicians to say, this is not acceptable. All right. Uh, Hilda and Sunova, I just heard a, a little bit of static. Are you still with us? We are still here, Joe. All right, excellent. Well, I want to turn that question in your direction. You know, you're raising awareness. You've been doing it. This is your second year now uh, by being, you know, right there in the Arctic, seeing the change. You Even just from last winter to this winter, you have seen a lot of change. So I'd love to hear any advice that you might have. Uh, for the younger generation. Well, absolutely, and that's um, something that we're currently uh, right in the middle of uh, working on for the future for, for, for us as a platform. But um, 
you know, we came up here, we left our full-time jobs um, and came up here to build off of our skill set, which is, you know, we're experienced expeditioners. We can, we can live this life. Uh, we can serve the researchers that are studying climate change by collecting data from the same place. And that's all great, but it's, it's uh, what you said, Inge, it's really very difficult to actually uh, encourage people to understand that what happens up in the Arctic is, is a mirror for what's going to happen or a reflection of the change that is sort of on the precipice of happening in the rest of the world. So, you know, our advice is um, get engaged. Um, you know, education is absolutely vital. So we're so grateful for these calls to have experts like Inga share, you know, her journey and how she got here as an activist and an act uh, an advocate. Um, get involved and show up and stand up for what you believe in. Uh, we cannot, you know, we're, we're no longer able to take it for granted that all of the wildlife you see in Africa and all of the wildlife that we're exposed to here, like the Arctic fox and the reindeer and the and the belugas and the polar bears, we can't take it for granted that they're always going to be around. We're at a very, very um, uh, tricky tipping point, so to speak. So um, we feel personally that citizen science is one way to contribute to to that. So we would love to encourage all of the youth out there on, on the call to get involved in a, a citizen science project. You can SciStarter.org. You can go to the Citizen Science Association.org. Um, actually, April is Citizen Science Month, and it's just a way for every single person out there to collect meaningful data, because that's what the researchers need. And that, in turn, educates you, it gets you inspired, it, it gives you a purpose, and I, that, that's something we really want to advocate for, in addition to maybe getting involved in politics, if that's your thing moving forward. Become a real advocate. Um, you know, stand up for those things that you want to protect and that you believe in. All right, absolutely. Um, speaking of citizen science, there is a question on YouTube about some of the projects that you're working on, Hilda and Sunova. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the phytoplankton and the ice cores that you're taking? Absolutely. Um, so the phytoplankton, we're doing a project with your Oh, and that's out of, um, it's with Allison at the Cripps Institute of Oceanography in La Jolla. And, you know, it's the, it's the thing you can't see, right, unless you actually take the phytoplankton out of the water and you preserve it, um, filter it, and send the frozen simple to Scripps uh, to Allison, and then she analyzes that under a microscope. Phytoplankton are the key to life. They are these tiny little microscopic organisms that live in very dense salt water. So the Arctic and the Antarctic is where Fjord Phyto as a project is, is heavily focused because of the dense salt water. And what's happening now is something really, really bad for the phytoplankton. And that is that as the glaciers are pouring more fresh water into the ocean uh, because they're melting and the ice caps are melting, Thing, the phytoplankton no longer breathe. They can't produce in fresh water. So um, what we do is we have a net. We have a phytoplankton net that we tow uh, from our boat or from a kayak, and then we collect the samples, um, which is a really important thing. And then the algae, the ice algae, um, they bloom mostly in these tiny little pine channels because salt water is not like a frozen um when it freezes it's not frozen as one solid chunk it's got many layers of it uh, and so these little microscopic uh, sea algae live in these brine channels under the ice and if you were to collect an ice core that we just did last week which was 30 centimeters thick you might um you know, in April, just brown ice, and it looks like brown ice to anybody. But to the scientists like Yenna from the University of um, Center of Svalbard that are studying this, it's also really responsible for oxygen in the atmosphere. Phytoplankton are responsible for 50% of the oxygen that we breathe, so bigger, greater than a rain, uh, than a forest. So it's so important for us to be studying the little things we can't see and the big things that we can't see. All right, absolutely. Uh, let's can, I, can I hop in there, Joe? Of course, yeah. 
Yeah, um, and absolutely. I mean, it's so critical. We forget that the air that we breathe is actually so significantly um, thanks to the oceans. And that's why we are feeling very strongly. We want to say, have a moratorium. Let's be precautionary. Let's have a pause on development in the Central Arctic Ocean because so little is still to be is understood. And there is so much still to be explored. And if we start just with business as usual and start with deep seabed mining and oil and, oil, um, and gas drilling and seismic blasting, we will not have the opportunity to really discover what really is happening under the ice. So I, I'm just super excited at the, at the work that you're doing already. Um, and I know that we're going to find some really interesting things over time. All right. I want to bring in Ms. Huxley again and see if there's another question from her crew. Uh, I'm going to bring her into the stream. There we go. Hey, Ms. Huxley. Hi, I'm just looking in my chat to see if we have any more questions here. That's we okay. Had the one. Oh, yes, there was one. Uh, the Arctic animals, uh, when their habitats are, um, when they're losing their habitats due to the loss of ice, what happens to the animals? Okay, uh, let me switch the view here. Who wants to jump uh, in on that one? I know Hilda and Sunova, you have noticed um, with the polar bears, right? When that sea ice doesn't arrive at the time that's expected, a large source of their food comes from the seals. Um, you actually last year had, had uh, witnessed a reindeer um, carcass, a kill uh, by a polar bear. So, you know, they're having to adapt the animals as their, their environment changes. Yes. Right, Joe, and that's a great question. Um, thanks for all the questions so far, actually. So adaptation is a really um, amazing thing. As humans, we've been adapting to COVID for the last year. Um, it's been testing us. And animals, uh, the wildlife get tested uh, with the changing climate. And so, yeah, we have seen, I'm going to pass it to him in a second. What I, what I just wanted to share as it relates to that, is that what will happen to the animals is we will have them no more. Uh, it's, it is just that plain and simple. We're living at a time where if the animals don't have the ability to uh, access their primary food source and stay healthy and thrive in the environment that they're living in, and in this case it's extreme, then they will stop reproducing. And if they stop reproducing, the population diminishes. So it's a it's a slow tumble downhill, which is why we need to protect the sea ice uh, because it's connected to the greater web of everything, which is where phytoplankton and the ice algae come in. They're, they're at the bottom of the food chain. And I want, uh, he was going to share the story about the uh, reindeer. Yeah, so, so all animals are have to decades or uh, since, they, since they came to this earth, uh, been uh, uh, pushed in all directions for uh, adaptation. But this time, things and changes are, are happening so fast, so, so it's so difficult for them to adapt. What we did see last winter, and I've seen that a couple of times before, is that um, polar bears are trying to find um, something to eat on, on land. Uh, if it's snow sea ice, they are forced to look for food on land. So last year we, we had a polar bear. We just we were out walking with Etra, and we walked. It was um, almost completely dark, so we saw a shadow in front of us running away from us, and we immediately understood it was a polar bear. And we walked over there, and sure enough, uh, the polar bear had actually hunted a reindeer, had been on the top of a little ridge, uh, maybe five six meters above. Um, the shoreline and the reindeer was down at the shore eating seagrass. So the reindeer was actually attacked and, and killed by the polar bear. The polar bear was eating that uh, reindeer when we walked over. And when we saw that, we just backed off and, um, and, and were quickly back to the, the hut, to the hut uh, in order for the polar bear to finish its, uh, its meal. All right, so a real example of, you know, having to adapt to those changes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we all have seen this, this 
this year that uh, the, the polar bear, since the ice formed so late, we see that uh, both the reindeer and the polar bears have a lot of uh, kelp uh, in their uh, food samples, actually. We, we collect food samples from, from the polar bears, and if they can't find any seals, they, they try to find and nutrients in, in other, uh, like, like in kelp at the shoreline. All right. Uh, I'm going to stop Mr. Shadis uh, again if they have any questions for us. I don't think we have any more for you, Joe. Thanks. All right. No worries. Uh, I'm going to grab another question uh, here via YouTube. And uh, Inga, this is for you about the Arctic Angels. How does, how does one become an Arctic Angel? Well, you, there is a, a, an application form on our website. Um, we, it's not a numbers game. It is, um, we do select angels in, because we're wanting to get a big geographic spread. And also, angels generally bring a network with them. They already tend to be involved with either wildlife or um, in some form with their own networks. And um, it's an interview process, but we're also about to launch our advocates, which is a broader network of people who are really just wanting to be advocates for the Arctic. The angels tend to have um, more one-on-one -on -one mentoring. They have a lot more exposure um, for speaking platforms. In fact, this afternoon, our Arctic Angel Coordinator, Emily, is on a, on a webinar with two other angels. Um, so it, it's an, a real investment, uh, but by all means, reach out. We're always happy to hear from you. Um, and the network of angels are amazing because they mentor one another. And um, it's just truly a community. Yeah, and I think that's so important, that point that it's not a, it's not a quantity thing because, yeah. you know, having 100 people sign up to do something, but only three be really active, um, right. So yeah, so it definitely makes sense having a process, um, to find the right advocates and those who are, who are going to get out and have their voice heard. Yeah. Very, very we are just about to send, in fact, today we had the second round of the competition, but we're just about to send two Arctic angels down to Antarctica on an expedition. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a special, uh, it's a special community. And we're very honored because we learn as much from the angels as they might learn from us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they're in for a treat. We had an event this morning with a polar guide who's been to the North Pole 15 times. Uh, and she shared her experiences in Antarctica as well. So yeah. uh, I can only imagine uh, what the winners will be able to experience in such just an incredible place that's irreplaceable on our planet. Yeah. And, you know, they're fast disappearing. That's the other thing we forget. Um, they may not exist in this form, um, so it, it's the opportunity to see it. I was really, had it not coincided with COP, which is the big climate conference that's happening in Glasgow uh, in November, uh, I, would, I would have been there like a shot. Uh, but we are going to try and get a live link, so maybe we can actually somehow link it in um, with, with your podcast, Joe. I think we can possibly find a way. We'll definitely talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so Hilda and Sunova, before we wrap up today, I want to see if um, you're able to come in and join us live today. Sometimes we get really lucky uh, and we get to see, say hi to Hilda and Sunova on video from Bum Sabu. So let's see if uh, if uh, the satellite, the stars are aligning with the satellite today. It's, um, we're trying to, to get on with video, but we have that little spiral going. Um, which indicates it's trying to load. So, yeah. Um, and it's been doing that for the last five minutes, actually. Um, I, know. I know all about the spiral. Um, <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Sometimes it just doesn't work <laughs> work for us. Um, I do want to, uh, before we do wrap up, just share another link here to uh, exploringbytheseat.com. Uh, uh, if you do head over, there's two spots you can check. If you head over to exploremytheseat.com backslash HITI, H-I-T-I, uh, you can see all of the events uh, and education pages that we've been working on since November. 
And then if you head over specifically and look either backslash climate change or look for the drop down menu, you can see an incredible uh, group of events coming up for next month in April. We're really excited uh, to host all of the speakers uh, in April. And Joe, um, if I may? Yeah, of course. Um, and so, Inga, thank you so much from, from us up here, uh, Inga and, uh, and myself. Um, what a pleasure to host you. And um, as we wind down our stay here at Thompson Group, we've been here for 16 months now, uh, more than that actually, and we'll be leaving in May. Um, our next presentation is with David Suzuki, and he is a very well-known um, TV host and a scientist who is based in Canada. And today is his 85th birthday. So, uh, Joel, if you don't mind, um, just so we can share with all the Canadians that are on the phone call now, and maybe those of you who don't know David Suzuki, you'll Google him. Uh, but we all need to spread community and share the people out there in the world that are advocating for uh, our natural spaces as both Inga and David and our other speakers coming up are doing. So if you wouldn't mind playing that tiny little clip um, and all of you can join in and sing the Norwegian song if you know it. <laughs> March 25th in the high Arctic. This is Sinova and Hilda. And we are Hearts in the Ice, and we're here with our dog Etra at the very tip where we just took a picture for you, David. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. And here's a Norwegian birthday song. Hurra for dig som fyller det dag av deg, vil vi gratulere. Alle i rundt omkring deg, vi står og ser det, og vil vi marsjere. Bukken ikke nei, hopp, hopp, spring, danser for deg, hopp og slett. Ønsker deg hjertet alle gode ting Og si meg så hva vil du mer Gratulere Happy birthday David Happy birthday Absolutely happy birthday David Suzuki is Uh well, I mean, I grew up watching the nature of things with David Suzuki. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's inspired an entire generation of environmental advocates. And I'm looking at the picture. I'm sure he's going to be really excited uh, for the birthday greeting from Svalbard. And it looks like Etra might be thinking about cake in that picture. She looks... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after the second we started singing out for the day, I think she thought, okay, hey, you are right. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I do want to start with a shout out to our um, camera classrooms and our classrooms uh, via YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. We love these events. We love your questions. Uh, it really is a lot of fun to host. Uh, Inga, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Thank you for sharing it with us today. Uh, and I look forward to exploring more uh, of the adventures of the Arctic Angels. And uh, Hilda and Sinova, again, just another great event. It is so, it's such a privilege to be able to connect uh, with the two of you each month uh, from Bumsaboo. Be well. Thank you yeah. so much, Thank you. Thank you so much, Inga. My and all of you guys that have been listening in. Just wanted to inspire all of you to, to um, engage and uh, be curious and look at stuff that you do every day, how you, maybe how you eat or how you travel, um, how much water you are using. Just look at the small things that you do every day. All yeah. right. Great advice to leave off on. Uh, one more time, the link is there. Check out April's event. Uh, and we look forward to more trips to Bumsabu before May, which is coming so fast. I can't believe how fast time flies. Absolutely. Well, hey, thank you so much. Thank you all so much, Joe and everybody. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. We are signing off for now. Bye.